next is Oscar Joffrey of Core Connects, a company that helps entrepreneurs, business owners to raise capital, primarily in the field of crowdfunding. Welcome, Oscar. How are you today? I'm doing great, Steve. Thank you for having me. So you are a passionate expert in raising capital for entrepreneurs through your company. Could you share a bit about what Core Connects does? Sure, thank you. So our journey started uh, 11 years ago now. My goodness, time flies when you're having lots of fun. Uh, when we were able to hear a presentation about democratization of capital, which really fundamentally changed everything as an entrepreneur that I knew. Democratization of capital meant at that moment for me is that we're going to be given an opportunity to finally take our opportunities to another selected audience um, to invest in that we were not able to do so in the past. And but the approach had to be different. Um, we knew that level of responsibility would be different. And uh, also the, the, the companies would have to be operationally different. So literally everything was going to change. So 11 years ago, we, myself and my co-founder, we uh, stayed within the market, we studied it, and we did anticipate that we would get to this point. I know it sounds weird. How do you anticipate it? Well, you, if, you have in, if you have experience in the capital markets, you understand how money has an impact on bringing people in. We hadn't seen that before in a private company. What we saw were private companies with maybe five shareholders, 10, maybe a hundred, but nobody ever actually even couldn't even fathom saying 10,000, how about a hundred thousand? How about a million privately held shareholders? So we set out uh, to, to build a, an all-in-one platform that empowers private companies to manage their shareholders, uh, to report to them, to be able to give them online e-voting, to help them raise capital, uh, through regulated entities, meaning registered broker dealers or funding portals, to keep the whole ecosystem compliant. And, but most important, to remove the friction and cost that often is, is associated with raising capital uh, for companies. So you're able to assist companies in raising capital through crowdfunding? Um, through also through Reg A, Reg D's, or your primary market is crowdfunding. Which is it? Um, we're we're actually agnostic to the regulation because we operate in so many different other countries. Not every country has a crowdfunding exemption. So, yes, in the United States today, we have three regulations we can utilize: Reg CF, which is a crowdfunding exemption. Uh, then we have Regulation D, which is the accredited, and Regulation A plus. So we work in all three. But what is, I mean, today, because of COVID-19 for the last, you know, 12 months, where have we seen the most uptake has been on Reg A and Reg CF, because investors are going online. And I mean, we're not getting together in a room anymore to pitch to 15, 20 investors. We're not getting in front of investors today to write a check for 150,000. But that same investor is going online, writing a check for 1,000. Or for, well, sorry, not writing a check, <laughs> using a credit card. <laughs> so, the, the, you know, the, the fundamentals have changed to a certain degree because of COVID-19. It has pushed everyone online that in the past would be reluctant because of that personal relationship. We call it crowdfunding, but, you know, to me, it's raising capital. And the, the, the fact that you raise it through a crowd versus, you know, going to a small group, you know, there are plus and minuses in either way. But the point is you have a choice. There's nothing better for a company than to have choices in your capital raising where before you only had, you know, maybe one or two, you had family and friends, an angel group, and then venture capital. And then what would you do, right? So when the Jobs Act was introduced in 2012, finally, and these regulations came in, it changed all that. It offered these, and we call them crowdfunding. And I remember the early days, people go, oh, crowdfunding is just for startups. You know, it's all nickel and dime, but it's not. We're seeing companies that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars that are generating 10, $20 million in revenue. Yes, they're startups, 
and and they are those who are already mature. There are those in the technology. I, I mean, it's A to Z on everything. It could be cannabis, it could be manufacturing, oil and gas, hemp, everything. So companies need capital. How do we help them raise that capital in efficient manner and the way they want to? Right. And, and we've undergone some changes in the crowdfunding rules recently. Could you address that for, for our audience? So the Jobs Act, when it was introduced in 2012, was great. I mean, it, like any introduction of new exemptions, people will go, oh, I wish it gave us more. Well, they amended it on November the 2nd, 2020. Um, Commissioner Clayton uh, amended certain regulations. Number one, it amended regulation crowdfunding to allow companies to raise up to now $5 million. That comes into effect 15th of March. That's right, $5 million. So we're now touching the, the series A round that we hadn't seen before. Regulation A has now been increased to $75 million. So now if you have a real estate company, biotech company, you now have another choice in you know, capital raising that you didn't even think about previously. Um, so it's opening up. So the higher they increase the limits, what, we, what we're seeing is an opening of different asset classes or different stages of companies entering it. So March the 15th is gonna be a wonderful day in the United States. Many, many companies are applying right now to be the first it's probably going to be off the shoot at least 50 or more companies that are going to be going online, raising their 5 million or 75 million under reggae. Beautiful. And, and when you say crowdfunding, um, you know, I know Kickstarter is a crowdfunding portal that many people are familiar with. Are we talking about the same thing? Are you, is your company like Kickstarter when people are, looking at doing that traditional crowdfunding model, what I heard you say was there's a $5 million limit, which is up from, I think, a $1,070,000 or so, um, which was the old rules. Now they just made it five times greater. But Correct. is that what you mean? Is, is Kickstarter similar to what you do? Kick, so let's take crowdfunding. So when it first came out, there are four models for crowdfunding. So the first model that we saw, everyone immediately saw was the Kickstarter model. And that, that's called a reward-based crowdfunding. So what that was, you put money in, you get rewarded with a product or something, but you don't get equity in the company. And it was very successful for the first year and a half, two years. It was going like gangbusters until it hit the gold mine. And what does that mean? There was a company that actually... Uh, uh, several companies that did so well, they were acquired. They were acquired during their Kickstarter round. And what happened was a revolt. The investor at that time thought themselves as investors. So this is where the problem occurred in crowdfunding with reward base. It all worked until the investor thought that they were actually an equity player in the company. Mm -hmm. So uh, they sadly found out that they weren't. The, the creators became billionaires. They didn't. Big battle about that. So that's the reward base. The other one is called the lending base crowdfunding. So lending, like lending club, where you lend money to another person like Kiva, really great in many different or, uh, parts of the world. It didn't do really well in certain regions because there's so many outlets already for capital. But again, it was another form of crowdfunding and that was introduced. The, the, the other one is donation-based. So we're always gonna have donation-based crowdfunding. Um, that is, you know, somebody's sick or, you know, and, and you go to GoFundMe, the, you know, and you donate money. Obviously you're giving money away. You're not, you're not getting anything in return. Those three different types of crowdfunding have no regulatory oversight. It's played with fraud and, you know, and they will still co they will still exist. It's trying to clean itself up. So that's one part. Equity crowdfunding is is it's it's in the same category as crowdfunding, but it's a totally different element altogether. It's regulated, the investors are protected, and the and the people putting money in actually have a stake in the company. So if the company does well, they do well. So that's the inherent difference between the four. Um, and equity based was the last one introduced. 
and it should have been the first, but <laughs> mm. it was the last one because they took regulators. So by the time equity-based crowdfunding went live in 2015, donations and lending and reward base had, you know, three, four years leg up. And obviously a lot of problems were exposed, but, you know, people put it all under the crowdfunding umbrella. And so crowdfunding kind of took a little bit of a, um, it took a little bit in the beginning, especially equity base to kick in for people to recognize the difference. But now we don't even, it, it, it's second nature. I mean, anybody's got a LinkedIn profile. I'm sure one time or another, somebody's knocked on your profile and said, hey, I'm raising capital for my company. Why don't you come and uh, do a webinar? Or I'm raising capital, can you look at my deck? And, and you would say, well, you know, they're, they're just raising capital. No, that's crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is anytime you got to go outside of anybody you know, because if you already know where the money is, that's not crowdfunding. That's, you know, the, you've known the party, but when you want to go outside of that, that's crowdfunding. You're mm -hmm. knocking on doors. The only difference is that crowdfunding, the rules came out where you could have a funding portal, a registered funding portal. What that means is they register themselves with the securities regulators. So they have regulatory oversight over their activities, which means that the way they conduct themselves is to protect the investors and everyone at large. So now you have these conduits where you can go, that's great. Um, so you can do it yourself or you can try, or you can go to the conduits. So even, even when the regulations come in, they give you choices. So they don't lock you down and say, okay, here, have, you know, here, here is, here's the regulation, go for it, boom, um, and off you go. They, they try to give you as many choices as possible. So you, you're talking about regulation, and that was one of the benefits, quote unquote, the lack of regulation in the area of crowdfunding previously. Is what I hear you saying that now the regulators have a say in all crowdfunding? They do. I'm not in all, just in the equity base, and because they've set the rules, we we now um, um opened it up. I mean, in the United States, 233 million Americans can now invest. Mm. I mean, they couldn't before. Now they can. There is no. You're not going to be left out anymore. You you can invest in the next, you know, uh, Airbnb or or a Facebook or a Twitter or any company that you felt or a Tesla. You can get in. It, you, you, you take the same risk as everybody else, but that's part of the investing. The, so we, they've created that layer. They've even given them the layer to, to buy shares of those successful base companies where only the ultra wealth could buy them. Not anymore. Secondary market is now available for even the retail investor. Mm -hmm. So the regulators piece by piece by piece have now done that. They've created the infrastructure they created and they didn't have to do much because the infrastructure was already there meaning what the regulated entities that knew what to do were already there and the trained personnel were there what they needed was the rules to allow them to carry out now once the rules were in place it still took a little bit of time because companies needed the these regulated entities needed to modify their approach what does that mean? Well, let me give you an example. A broker dealer who does reg D offerings is used to collecting a ton of information from the investor, and that becomes their standard. I need A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A to Z. And then the regulators introduce a regulation like regulation CF. And, the, and now the broker dealer can use it. But the regulation only requires A, B, C, D, E. And this becomes a huge disconnect for a team that's used to going A to Z. And so they need to understand the harmonization that they can still do A to F because they're relying, they're using this exemption to raise the capital. And why is this important that they need to bring, they need to do A to F rather than A to Z? It's because if they don't, they're disconnecting themselves from the way the others are portraying. So, if the others are only doing A to F and you're doing A to Z, what is the likelihood of success for you, even though you're a regulated entity, very low. Same thing with Reg A. Reg A is probably one of the most difficult uh, regulations broker dealers have a problem with. 
um, not because uh, they don't understand the regulation, what the regs have set out is how do they do their job, but at the same time, you know, make it as simple as everybody else is doing it. And again, it's, it's just putting yourself in those buckets. So yes, the regulators have regulated the, the, the issuer, the investor, the parties that need to be involved. That clarity is everything because what it does, it provides a comfort zone for investors to know that if something goes wrong, there's an accountability element and knock on wood, we, every, everything has gone well to date, but it's just knowing that people are doing the right thing. You know, this is company ABC, this company's real. Rather than if you go to somebody's website, you have no way of knowing if it's real. Right. This so, way, at least you know that part. So when we're looking, thank you. The, so when we're looking at crowdfunding, that's kind of the small side of things, but it's going from that million 70 up to the 5 million as of March 15th, which is awesome in the US. Um, and broker dealers that have registered for uh, regulation CF can participate in that and take minimal information uh, versus what they take for, let's say, Reg D. Let's segue over to Regulation A. Um, and in Regulation A, there's Reg A and Reg A plus. Could you demystify that? And I think you said it's going to be 75 million. Um, yes. And I believe the limits were what five uh, fifty million was that the number fifty million. So yeah, it's, it's up to fifty million now. It's moved up to seventy five. So Regulation A apparently was introduced. Oh my goodness, maybe twenty thirty years ago. Never used. Um, I think the limit that people could raise was like half a million dollars. So it really wasn't a regulation that ever got any. So during the Jobs Act, it was a regulation that was revamped. So that's why it's called Regulation A+. Plus. So it's just the next iteration of it. So A and, and they, A+, plus are not any different. It's now no, A+. It's just A+. Plus. That's right. Okay. There is no A anymore. There is no... Um, some people refer to it as Regulation A. There are people who have been in the industry long enough to go, ah, oh, Regulation A is done. Nobody's using it. No, this is A+. Plus. And to them, it's sort of like, this new magical regulation. It isn't. It's just a regulation that got no different than Reg D. We used to have only 506B. Now we got 506C. So what's the difference? The requirements are the same, except for now you can do general solicitations. So it's just same thing in Reg A. So Reg A came up with a regulation to allow a company to raise up to $75 million from the general public. The public receives a fully liquid security. The company needs to file a form one with the SEC to get qualified. The company needs a registered FINRA broker dealer to be able to sell it in all 50 states. The role of the broker dealer here is to make sure that the investors uh, are properly qualified, meaning ID and AML and suitability. And what's the suitability? Have you ex are you investing more than 10%? And that's it. So is again, this is the same. 10% of liquid net worth or 10% of your total net worth? What's that 10% number? Whichever is greater, net worth or your income. Or your income. So net worth or, your or income. income. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So if somebody puts in, I make 85000 a year and I've got uh, $250,000 of assets. So 10% of both, one is 8500 The other one's 25000 So this individual can invest up to $25,000 on this offering. In that offering and only. And the, the broker-dealer make sure that that's, that's what it is uh, when they get their new account form and they do all their background and all that stuff. There, there is no account forms. So the broker dealer doesn't need to create an account because the, 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 the broker dealer is performing a compliance function, not a opening account function. And that, that's what I said. This is where the broker dealers that have mastered it, companies like Downmore and Toro, Rialto, um, the, what they've mastered out of this is they understood their role. And by understanding the role, they know that I'm not the one selling it, but I'm the one who has to safeguard it to make sure that it's being done properly. Mm -hmm. My role is ID and AML. These are not my clients. I'm required to keep track and record of it for FINRA for audit purposes, but these are not my clients. These mm -hmm. are the clients of the issuer. Mm -hmm. And so for them, it's, they did the ID, they passed the email function list, 
And under the regulation A criteria, the individual said this, this, and they, yeah, it meets the regulation, done. Boom. There is, so it's not, that's why I say a lot of the BDs have, uh, have a lot of, the ones that struggle with it are the ones that are thinking of their reg D, their traditional, you know, business they have, which you do. This is the part that is tough. And so, the, but the key now is it, this business is not growing at the moment. It's, it's kind of, it's going to be stale for the next 12 months due to COVID-19. It's going to come back up. It's never going to go away. But in the meantime, that same investor that you're managing over here and you think you have, that same investor is investing on the other side. Mm. And we're seeing something really interesting. We're seeing companies that typically would do Reg D's like real estate who are now converting to Reg A. And the number one reason is it's less paperwork. Mm. The investor only needs to provide their ID, their uh, you know answer a couple AML questions, and that's it. There mm. is no investor verification needed. So from an investor perspective, they're going, wow, I can invest any amount. I'm, I can still invest as an accredited, but I don't need to go through that verification. No, nope. under the rule, under this particular rule, the investor attests to saying, I am an accredited based on one of these two, and that's it. There is no you know, requirement uh, to go any further than that. But even if they're not an accredited, they ind indicate their income and their network, and that's it. And you're done. It's a, and you're done. So is the broker dealer allowed to charge a commission on a transaction and still they get are. compensated without yeah. having all of that crazy paperwork? It's happening every day. They're, I right. mean, traditionally right now, BDs are taking 1% because their role is, is a broker dealer performing the compliance activities on behalf of the company. Hmm. And so the traditional role of a broker dealer again, this is coming back to all these changes, is that I'm the broker dealer. I'm the one who's going to go out and sell it. Well, in a reggae, you're not. The issuer is selling it. The issuer is going out and bringing the attract. It's doing advertising. It's bringing all that traffic to their website, not to the broker dealer website. And on the website, the issuer will have a button uh, that will allow the investor to invest directly there on the website or through their mobile device. And on the website, the, the issuer has to have all the disclosures copied to their form one, to the regulatory filing, who their advisors and all that. The broker dealer's name is there, and but it's in the background. The investor mm -hmm. is not being sold by the broker dealer. The, well, the investor about, is being... So how about the situation where the broker dealer for instance, in my cir circumstance where my advisors were selling a product, is that a different, that's a whole different level of requirement because they are doing the selling to their clients? Not necessarily because the, the investor still needs to go through the, it's still a regulation A. Like how, it, all they're doing is advising on it and even, all of it is part of the same regulatory filing. I that's see. why I said it, it there, there are companies who are already doing outbound calls, broker dealers that are doing that. It doesn't change it because ultimately okay. the investor needs to make the decision based on the, the form one filing, right? Got it. Okay. Right. Well, and uh, so the broker dealers that have distribution, you'll be able to charge a little bit more because you have something that the other BD doesn't have. Hmm. But what is interesting about COVID uh, is that the same way it's affecting the restaurant business where people are pivoting, the way other businesses are becoming lean, the broker dealer that people would normally never look at because they go, oh, they're so small. Well, that small broker dealer was so agile that they've now become the big player in, in the game. Mm -hmm. So this is where a lot of different changes are going to occur now with the $75 million raise. We're going to see a different type of BD coming in. They're going to struggle with it. Um, you know, we, we've spoken to some BDs, well, we need to charge seven or 8%. I go, you can try to charge anything you like, mm. but I don't see any issue of paying seven or 8%. Right. They go, but we do all the work. Well, unless you're bringing all the 45,000 investors they're going to need, 
I, I would agree with you. I'm not going to disagree with you at all. But you keep this in mind. You want to charge 7% and the industry is at one. And I think broker dealers can move to 2 and 3%. And what will move the needle is the broker dealer that can bring distribution. That's what right. moves the needle over because the issuer is going to spend 200, half a million dollars in marketing investor acquisition costs. So if you can reduce that cost, I'm all for it's it. It's a home run. Yeah. It, of course. Of course. So, so the, they're, so the industry is going through, I'm not going to say an influx. It's, it, it's a momentum. We, we, we started with this type of BD, we're now adding a different type of BD, and this one will continue to grow. These are trying to get their feet wet, and along the way, they're gonna do two things. They're gonna scare off their clients, and their clients are gonna leave and they'll go somewhere else, because they want, they're going, it was so simple over there, it was easy, boom, boom. And in here, it's taken too long. Mm. I, I, I don't, see, so the investor experience is critical. Because what we see is 30% of the investors in reggae are reinvesting in other reggae deals. Right. And so they, they that, want to put that money at risk and do something that they can connect with. I love it. Let's let's look at reggae plus from a couple of different perspectives. Sure. Um, first is uh, social media, utilization of social media. So in crowd uh, uh, in crowdfunding versus uh, reg A plus. Is social media uh, putting those offerings out onto the web permitted by uh, the broker dealer, by the company? Is that something that you're allowed to do? Yes, yes, it's it's a full, you know, um, you can do full, full on advertising. So advertising in TV commercials. So you can do those before you are qualified. So people, again, you gotta have your lawyer your reggae securities lawyer and they'll tell you, so let's say um, you wanna do a reggae, start doing your advertising now. You're not saying you're raising money, you're just telling your story. I mean, for anybody listening to this, if you think advertising is saying I'm raising money, that's not yeah. the game. <laughs> you're, you're not getting it. You need to talk to experts who are gonna guide you. So uh, because you get to general, do general solicitation to everyone, the, the heading here is called investor acquisition and it comes in different techniques. There's public relations, sub firms you can hire that are gonna help you with that, investor relations firm. There's the video. The video tells the story mm -hmm. because you want those eyeballs coming to you and staying there and feeling the story. Social media, Twitter, Facebook and all that. Um, how, media firms, advertising, doing webinars, newsletters, and the big one is publishers. That's right, publishers. So there are publishers who will catch onto a story and then distribute that note to as many of their registered uh, uh, newsletter or publisher uh, guide, and you could hit a home run, meaning they all like your story and they start buying your shares when, when you're doing your capital raising. There are certain things you can do while you're doing your capital raising, and there are certain things you can do before you're, you go live with your offering. And but it's full on. Who's doing all the selling? The company. So the, the company, the firm can't, the broker dealer can't do social media advertising prior to the offering, but the company can. Correct. The company can go out and start advertising the company, not the offering. Um, you know, doing TV commercials, drawing attention to what you're doing. Once you go live you can now promote that you are raising capital at $5 a share and all that. You will find that that technique doesn't really work. The technique that really works is the technique of telling the story. People don't buy equity in a company just because it's fun. People buy the passion of the, the, the CEO, mm -hmm. the passion of what they're doing. Like some of the clients we both have, right? World Tree. What's yeah. so passionate about that? Regardless of how much they're looking for. Well, they're planting trees. Well, how impactful is that? Well, they're cleaning the, the air for us. This particular tree, the more they plant, the more the air gets cleaner. That's something we can all understand. We can all feel, and if I can put $1,000 to put five trees down, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. So people need to understand that it becomes a win-win situation. Yes, people need to make money. And, but they also need to feel that passion. So I think that's the part 
that's the art in all of this. How do you get that passion in that storytelling? One particular client, well, we have a couple. One of them is in the cannabis space. And so up until this particular company, most cannabis commercials were the same, you know, rapping or music and, and all that, which, so it's kind of this, you, you go, yeah, of course, right? Partying and all that. Well, this one was different. When you watch the videos and you watch the storytelling, you go, wow, that's a, that's a nice farm. Mm. This is a wholesome family making an honest living. And they would show the work, you know, the people working on the fields. And so it changed the narrative completely. And that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to change that narrative that their you investing in their company was doing a, a number of things. It was good for the, you know, the soil. It was good for the farming community. So it became a, a farmer story. So this is critical. And so that's just one piece. So one, you get someone who creates you that story, then you meet companies who can deliver the story. And then there are those who share the story to see what I mean, to eventually bring all that traffic down to your site. So it sounds like you're agreeing with the title of my book, which is Entrepreneur's Guide to Raising Capital Through Storytelling. It sounds like it, uh, it resonates with you. It's all about the story. Yes, stories. of course. Yeah, it is about the story. In today's world, I have not seen a company successfully raise their money if they are just purely saying, I'm raising money at $5 a share. It's not about that. It's got to be more than that. In fact, uh, every successful client we have, it's been the, the story, the, 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 the true artist in all this are the investor acquisition people who look at the product and they, they believe in it. They got to believe in it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have one client right now that when it goes live, it's a game changer. You cannot, um, how should I say, you cannot sympathize with it, it, it without feeling something for it because everybody has known somebody involved with funds. And it, it, it's, it's such a heartbreaking story that, but nowhere in the story are they talking about investing. Yeah. See, so well. that brings you in you are curious and they go oh we are raising money to make this even bigger well at that moment you're like wow i'm in yeah right so so maybe after this call you could share with me that company maybe it's a company i want to highlight i would love to be able to take a look at you know anybody that you think is impactful um, so moving on on reggae plus one of the things i really enjoy about reggae plus um, is that audited financials are part of the process as well, which, you know, having been an accountant myself, understanding that that's the highest level of integrity from a financial statement perspective, meaning that the accountants are doing, they're, they're validating certain information, verifying um, information directly with banks and vendors and so on. And it seems to be a unique aspect of Reg A+. I don't know if Reg D's or ra uh, crowdfunding or Reg CF um, are requiring audited financial statements. Are they? No. Uh, Reg CF is just notice to reader, if that. Um, Reg D's, um, it, it, it's kind of an option if you can so get the shareholders yeah. to up. So Reg A, usually, usually a compilation, which looks really official, but people don't know what goes on behind that. Yeah. So regulation A is the, the nuts. And, I mean, not only from the original filing when the company files, but ongoing, this is the, this is the one mandatory requirement they must do, mm -hmm. um, which is the audited financial statements. And to your point, it gives you a better clarity on the use of funds that the company, the, in, the investors put in, was it used the way it was intended? It gives them an opportunity to, um, to review that. And I think now that the industry is maturing and in particular companies that are using it for the second year or third year in a row, that accountability is gonna be even more critical now. And so, because it, it look, when I, when I coach people on regulation A, I'm very straightforward about a number of things. So first, they need to be aware why the regulation was amended. The Jobs Act was foremost to create jobs. So they wanted you to create jobs. So 
you're raising, you're going to get to raise 75 million to create jobs. That's what you want. Number two, democratize capital, give everyone an opportunity to participate. So that's great. Number three, give the ownership back to owners. So now you, you, you don't get to lose your company, but that comes with responsibility, you know? So you will keep your, your valuation. So if you think your company's worth $300 million, okay, great. You're going to get it. Well, now you got to give something back to the investors. So it's a given. So before you would get the you would get the, the money you needed, but you didn't get the valuation, and somebody else told you what to do. You didn't like that, or you know somebody else took over your company. Now you got it. Now you got a responsibility. So I'm I'm really my big focus on reggae is that great. I know you're going to be successful. What are your plans for managing all this? And they go, well, I'm going to use your tool, Oscar. I can manage. You said I'm limited to share. I go, look, it's the tool. It's not the golden wand. They go, what do you mean? It's, well, it's a tool to deliver. You still need to come up with a messaging on a regular basis. You still need to have a strategy on how you're going to work with them continuously because these people didn't just invest in you because you know, um, they're going to make a buck. Yes, they are. But if you treat them like they get treated in the public markets, we're in for a storm. Mm. So you need to really think about that. So yeah, audited financial statements are going to give me clarity and numbers. But as a, but as a member of this company, I need more. I want to know more. And so the interesting thing is when a company is raising capital, if you really watch any type of company, Reg CF, Reg B, Reg A, they are so bloody transparent. It's a joke. I mean, they they go, oh, we're, we're taking a flight to New Delhi to talk to a new partner and this and that. So they're doing all these wonderful things. We're doing a webinar. We're doing this. They're doing something. They're telling people constantly. As soon as they raise their money, yes, uh, we'll report dark. to you. They go dark. And it's sort of like can't be. you can't be. And that's where, so when you start treating people like that, shareholders, we're, you know, so we spend a lot of time making sure companies have a strategy. Who is the assigned individual to manage these 10, 20, 30, 40, 100,000 shareholders? What's your strategy? Are you going to, are you going to engage with them? Um, so in most companies, if you treat them just as shareholders, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. If you treat them like brand ambassadors or clients, you're going to succeed. And you're not only going to succeed 10 times, you're 100 times. There's plenty of examples we now have, companies like BrewDog, who have taken the concept and just amazed it. They made them into brand ambassadors, every one of their shareholders. So they don't have to hide. They do advertising. But what better way to spread the word than word of mouth, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's powerful. So... Everybody needs to look at all the different. So this is a great regulation all the way around. There's responsibility components that the, the, the audited financial statement, the fact that you keep, keep your ownership in your company, you're giving liquidity investors. So now you have something to give. Now you got to give something back. And, and that is you need to dedicate yourself to that element of don't call it reporting because you'll think it's a headache. Then you'll be just like every other publicly traded company. I have to report to my shareholders. Mm. Well, there's the problem. You don't have to. You want to the same way you were doing it. And a lot of them just don't have the experience, but then they need to budget for that. They need to make sure they bring in someone. And it should be someone who's used to working with clients. Yeah. <laughs> every Why clients? Because that's what they are. Yeah, for that's sure. That's what they are. So, so we've got crowdfunding, which will bring in smaller investors, right? And the upside could be that you create raving fans, a, a great number of raving fans, and they can be out there sharing with the world the benefits of owning your company. The next level, which would be a reggae plus, allows people who are not let's call it mega wealthy, non-accredited investors and accredited investors to invest on a similar playing field as a crowd CF, but the upper limits are different. So we go from 5 million now to $75 million. We've got audited financial statements, which is a big plus. 
you called it a 506C before. Um, and now let's talk a bit about Reg D and get into the realm of really getting into the accredited investor or super accredited investor and why anybody would choose to do that. Great. I'll, I'll go into that. So there's just one little addition to the Reg CF that the regulators changed as well. So up until recently, the only the the companies could raise from any American, you know, 233 million Americans raise up to a million. And um, there were limits. So if you were an accredited, you could invest, but you couldn't, you know, if you really liked the deal, you couldn't exceed a certain limit. Under the new regulation, um, under the $5 million increase, the accredited investor can now invest an unlimited amount of money. So beyond so, the 5 million. No, be yeah, they could invest a whole five million if they wanted under okay. that regulation. But five million is your max, regardless whether for the company, okay. correct? Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. And uh, obviously, the the accredited can also participate. Accredited can participate in all of them. It just up until recently they had limits. So why? Do you, so Reg CF, it's general public. Reg A, general public. Then we get into the Reg D models, which is the accredited. Um, investor model, which usually is between one to three percent of the country's population, um, give and take. So it's people who have a net worth of you know over a million dollars, or have a salary of two hundred thousand plus per year, and so on. And but when a comp an individual is investing using this exemption, they need to go through a verification process. So typically in the past, they would sit down with their broker and share their information. So what is that? Their tax return, they would need to share their, you know, their assets. So it's very confidential information, right? So during the introduction of 506C, we, we, we brought that online. And as much as it was great, it's always been, it hasn't been the game changer. It, investors still reluctant to give that kind of information online. It would just became very difficult. Now with COVID-19, there's no other choice but to do it online. So the investor now today, that same investor is now, and again, because of COVID-19, they're looking at, I can invest in a Reg D offering, which I have to hold the security for a minimum 12 months, 12 months. Or I can go here, invest the same amount of money in another company, very similar, but they're using a Reg A. And on this one, I got no hold. I can trade it immediately. Hmm. So, and on this one, I got to give them my tax return or this or that. On this one, I just got to give them my ID, my email, and I'm done. So this is where a new revelation is coming around. So this is why it's affecting BDs quite a bit because this same investor is liking this now. They, they were swayed not to touch it before, but people like investing, they're not going to go away. They need to put their money to work and they're finding ways to do it. And so the Reg D regime today is, is really good for companies who already have a stable of investors that they can go to. The companies that are struggling with it are those who have to go and find them. So why is that? Well, you're not gonna get to meet them face to face. Yes, you'll have a Zoom meeting, but you're asking them to write a check for fifty, a hundred thousand dollars, and they're not going to get to see you face to face. It's a really difficult undertaking, very, very difficult. On this hand, I only asked you for five hundred dollars, but here's the funny thing: this same individual <laughs> that goes in for five hundred, by the time the offering is done, they will put in one hundred and fifty thousand. People, what are you talking? About? Because this individual keeps coming back week after week and says, you know what, it was good at that. You know what, I'll put another thousand. Then I'll put another 5,000, then I'll put, you know, 10. It equals the same. It's so it, we are, we're noticing something very interesting. The, on, on the reg A's, we're seeing more accredited investing now than ever before. It's not the millennials. That's another myth I want to put outside there. Everybody goes, crowdfunding is just for millennials. No, it's not. Millennials went to Kickstarter. Real money is, people that are actually 40 or older. That's where the real money's coming from. These are people that are not putting in the minimum of $100. They're putting in 1,000, 5,000, 15,000, 20,000. 
Some people are putting over a million dollars into a reggae deal. So the, so the, I think for right now, the reg D's are, are, it's a great regulation if, if the other pieces of it were there, where the, the ability to meet that investor face to face, you know, we have an entire cottage industry that will take a company and bring them into different hotel rooms to, to, to meet 15, 20 of these accredited investors or angel groups. Now they're putting it online. And we've been going to them and asking, so why are you not investing? And they're going, we are investing. So we knew that. So, but why are you not investing in these new ones? Well, we don't know them. I prefer to meet people face to face. Um, you know what? I'll just wait. See, I'll just wait. Um, so it, it, if, we, if we weren't talking COVID-19, I think I would have a, uh, my view of, of, of this regulation would be very different. Mm. But right now, because I'm seeing the shift to reggae's, it's going to be so, but they are still occurring. And I'll, and I'll only say it this way. It's a great regulation for those who already have a base of accredited investors. So if you're a broker dealer that has 10,000, maybe 5,000 accredited and you know them, they trust you, take on the deals. You can close the deals. Right. But if you're an issuer trying to do it yourself, I'm sorry. It, it's a very, very difficult thing it's to a do. Tu- it's, a, it's a tough list, lift. Um, so on the Reg D side of things, I know you had mentioned that Reg A plus was under 506C, I believe. I believe in the in the D realm, is there a 506 A and B? Is that right? So there's a 506 B. So the difference between the B and the C is general solicitation. So when you do a 506 B, you can't solicit, you can't do, you know, everything. It's people you already know. No social media, none of that. None. So you can take on the first um, um, 35 investors can be non-accredited, right? Family and friends. And then the investor number 36, you know, Stephen can come in and say, I'm an accredited, but they don't need to do accreditation. So you can take their word for it. You can ask more questions, but so 506B, because it's considered people you already know. So the vast majority of Reg B offerings are 506Bs. 506Cs are just catching on. You see them in platforms like Seed Invest, uh, WeFunder. So it's a it's a general solicitation. They're harder, but they're doable. Um, some companies do a mix of Bs and Cs. That there's nothing wrong with doing that. Mm-hmm. There's a group of people you already know, and there's new ones that you are um, just learning about. So the um, but I, 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 I caution anyone doing anything with right these today. I mean, today, meaning February, 2021, until you can be in a room with accredited investors, in particular, because you are asking for a sizable you know, check and they're going to want to do their due diligence on you because they have nobody else doing it for them. On the other ones, it's already done for them. Do, do you see what I mean? On a reg A, it's the SEC. So they just have to come in and invest. Do you see what I mean? They, they yeah. go, okay, I didn't need to. Do. On a reg D, the SEC qualified the offering. You know, So if there are some shady business here, they would have caught it before I would have caught it. <laughs> so you'd, it, you'd hope, it, you'd hope. But you know, the regulators like to say they have not approved. They have simply reviewed. Um, so, well, we'll see, but so 506B and 506C, um, 506C is applicable to both, uh, Reg A plus and Reg D and allows for social media, um, for social media advertising for, on behalf of the company and in certain circumstances on behalf of the investment firm, the broker dealer. Is that correct? Yeah, 506C, yeah. 506C, you can do advertising general solicitation. It's basically the same thing as an A. It's just that you are attracting a, a smaller hub of the investors. That's Got it. it. So off of, uh, before we get off of Reg D, um, Reg D often is used for institutional investments as well, right? Because it's a lower price point or so, or lower commission or whatever that might be. Um, 
in a 506C, we don't really see the, it's usually in 506Bs, right? So, but um, the, the institutional investor now is entering the reg A's as well. So I, I think, it, let me put it to you this way, the norms we knew prior to COVID-19 are starting to change. And meaning that money is changing the way it, it, it flew itself across. The, meaning that if, if certain deals are not going through the traditional route of BDs. So give you an example, most Reg D offerings don't need a broker dealer. They don't. I don't advise anybody right now to do a Reg D offering without a broker dealer. And why? Because how does the investor at the other side of the fence know that you're for real? The only assurance they have is if you're working with a FINRA broker dealer, right? Yeah. So, because, or a because registered of the, broker. Because of the due diligence that the BD goes through in order to uh, evaluate that company? Correct. Got because it. on a Reg D offering, the BD has to do all the heavy lifting, right? So you're taking the responsibility of that company and before you represent it to investors. So on that one, as I said before, if there's BDs with a pool of investors, in particular credit and institutional, take them on, take them on. I think that that, that is the only way right now a company can succeed doing a Reg D offering that is going out there. But, it, but before COVID-19, a lot of them were just, you know, going out there on their own, soliciting people on LinkedIn. Hey, you know, I'm coming in New York and we schedule a meeting. Well, those meetings aren't happening anymore. Do, do you see what I mean? So that now you don't have the connectivity anymore. You don't have the face-to-face. -face. You can't join the angel groups. So now you do need to go to the BD. So the BD will take, you know, a month or two to do the due diligence before you go live. So, I mean, I got one client right now that's been, I think after three months, they've just finished BD for a right D offering. And after three months, a lot has changed. And now the board decided, you know what, let's just do a reg A. See, it, it, it's even the, even the broker dealer recommended that to them because it, it, there was still no guarantee that there was an investor base that because they weren't going to be able to meet the investors face to face. And I, and I can't emphasize this enough. There is a big difference between getting somebody to write a check for $500 versus 50,000 or 25,000. So the real number what people keep asking me is, Oscar, what is the number that's the lowest number that people have to meet face to face? And I say, it's the number related to whoever's representing your company. They go, what are you talking about? Hmm. Well, if it's a broker dealer and that broker dealer has got a relationship with that investor, that number could be a million. Right? Well, it could be 10,000, I don't know. But if you're doing it by yourself, I, I assure you, would you give somebody $10,000 or 25,000, somebody you didn't know? Of course you wouldn't. So why would you think anybody else would here? But on the other side, you got a qualified offering by the SEC and the minimum investment's $100, <laughs> right? So you buy a hundred bucks on your credit card, on your credit card, just like you would go on a weekend. And then you come back and the deal is still going live because the company has a year to raise it. You come back again and go, you know what? They're doing pretty good. It seems real. Yeah, you know what? I'll buy another 500 bucks. And then again, it keeps adding. So we've noticed something very interesting, the dynamics here. And we do interview the investors to find out. So it's interesting how they think about investing. I see Reg A as doing it in piecemeal but they're still adding the same total. This one wants all the check in advance and the investor needs to do due diligence. Investor does no due diligence. See, so, so let's look over these th three platforms um, and I'll just go cost to set up. What is the cost of entry for all of these? What would be a guesstimate to be able to set up your crowdfunding or your Reg A plus or your Reg D? So, for Reg CF, if you want to raise a million dollars, the the estimate that we often give companies is to budget between thirty five to forty five thousand dollars, which would include your legals, your financials, and then of course your marketing. So now, if you're going to raise five million dollars, it's a multiple, right? Reg D, I mean, outside of your BD, so your BD is going to charge anywhere between ten thousand to twenty five thousand to do the due diligence. 
um, and uh, to get a due diligence report before you can represent them. Or they can buy one from a law firm that produces that, but you're still gonna fork out a fee. And then marketing, most of them think that they don't spend any money, but you do, you sh it's gonna be marketing and the likelihood that your financial statements is zero. So Reg D is always the easiest because you can go out on a napkin, right? Reg A, totally different. So Reg A, we get companies to budget between 250,000 to half a million. It all depends on the raise. The legals are gonna cost you 50,000. Audited financials are gonna cost you between 3,500 and starting, meaning you're a brand new company to how many years you're operational, right? It depends. Then you got your filing fees. Um, then you need your uh, investment platform technology. You need your SEC registered transfer agent. You need your FINRA broker dealer. Um, you need your investor acquisition uh, providers um, that are gonna provide all of it. And, but there is something really great about Reg A and unlike all the other regulations is that as the funds are coming in, the broker dealer in the company can be closing monthly, weekly, bi-weekly, and those funds can be used for operational, which is to re, uh, you know, re-advertise out there. So there was one particular company called uh, Emerald. They hit the $50 million mark just before December 31 in 2020, and they raised it just like that. They, they got a, the money that were coming in, they were allocating it a certain for the budget of uh, marketing because it, it it's, so people go, well, that's pretty expensive. Well, if you add in all the cost of a traditional capital raise, travel, time, you know, joining events and all this, it equals the same. It equals the same. Um, and I would say this is even more efficient. So, so when we're looking at people in these three realms, are there companies that are utilizing all three? Um, at the beginning, we did see some companies doing all three at the same time. It doesn't work very well. It's very messy, confusing for the investor. What we're seeing now is a lot of companies in the U.S. using Reg CF to raise half a million dollars so they can do the Reg A. So we're, we're, Reg CF is becoming the, the, the stepping stone to a Reg A. So mm -hmm. I would say right now there's probably maybe 20, 30 of them that are doing just that. So for those investors, you're coming in early. So you're getting, you're going to get the bump up as soon as they do their Reg A. Got it. And, and that's a good point to, um, to talk about is these are all equity raises, not typically going to be debt focus. Is that correct? At the moment, they have been. Um, nothing is saying that it, so in Reg A, typically all you do see is debt, or, it's debt or equity and that's it. 99.99 are, you know, they're, they're equity based. Um, it's straight vanilla, you know, voting, non-voting, you know, uh, you could offer a dividend. We haven't seen it yet, um, but I, I think it's coming. Uh, you could offer debt. There's nothing stopping. It's just keeping in mind, it's no different than Reg CF. You have to make the you have to make the model simple for people to understand. There is one great thing about Regulation A and Regulation um, uh, CF, uh, more so in A, that really distinguishes it again from a Reg D offering. So one, there's no hold period. That that is huge, right? Um, and then of course incentivization. So the investor can be incentivized. So they can be rewarded for investing. For simply putting in $100, $500, or, $1, or you can say, look, if you put in, uh, minimum is 100 but if you put in $500, I'll get you a badge. Here it is. If you put in $1,000, I'll give you a badge and a nap sack. Um, we have one company that, depending on what level you do, there's one that if you put in $100,000, they'll include you in the movie, right? So you'll get two minutes in the movie. So imagine you always want to be in the movies. Here's your chance to get in. We had one that was giving away beer for life. We had one that was giving vodka away. There was one that was giving away juices away. Um, so you, there, we have one that's giving away pulleys, you know, for your blinds. Um, so you can be as creative as you like. Could you give away a car? Sure. If your minimum investment is fifty thousand dollars and you can give away a car, so be it. Nothing is stopping you from rewarding that investor 
from putting money in and you saying, okay, you put in a hundred thousand dollars, I'm going to give you a new car. So Amazing. any companies has got a consumer based product. Uh, you know, let's say you want a playground, right? I, I have a client right now that's going to, it's uh, they're they're in the car industry. So they're going to invest and they're going to get free tickets to come into the playground. See, you're incentivizing them for something of value that they already know. I'm used to paying $200 per ticket. Wow, look at that. I'm getting, you know, free tickets. That's for me, that's a thousand bucks, right? So that incentivization is very powerful. So free li liquidity on my security, I'm getting incentivized and I don't need to do any legwork on due diligence. There you go. Well, that works. So you just hit on a really good point as we start to wrap up here. Um, and that is liquidity. Um, do all these things have a start and an end? You know, what we're talking about private companies that don't have a, a, a market in which they're traded on. Um, how do people get out, you know, if they have, you know, a death of a shareholder or they simply need the cash, you know, are they basically out of luck or is there ways of being able to liquidate your position somehow? You know, up until, I mean, part of the Jobs Act was to include liquidity was the final and I'm so happy now that we finally have it. And I, when I say we have it, I mean, it's real. You can touch it. You can say it's there. The regulation al already provided the mechanism to do it. We just didn't have the venue. So we now have a registered FINRA broker dealer that almost took three years to get its license to allow the ability to trade Reg CF, Reg Ds, and Reg A shares. And what's even more remarkable is that we're talking about allowing the ability for somebody to trade as low as $100. I mean, that's a game changer. And so we're very excited about this because all of this, you know, it's been our philosophy of empowerment. So we're empowering the investor to invest efficiently for the company to manage it, for the broker dealer to review it. And all that is to the end goal to allow that liquidity activity. And we're now there. This is now live in 2021. Investors will be able to have that ability to do that. Now, companies will need to subscribe to that because you know, it, it's an additional element that you need to do because it is private company shares. Um, but Reg A's can immediately trade. Reg D's, of course, they got the 12 month. Reg CF's, you got the 12 months. But once the whole periods are released, people are looking for, um, you know, some form of liquidity. And I think you said it best. I will say this from our end at CorkinX, it's not so much that people are demanding to have their securities liquid. It's never about that. It's about what if I have to? And that's, a problem we've had in Reg D forever. In Reg D, you people go, Oscar, I really like your company, but what's my exit strategy? So you can tell them all that and he goes, so I'm in for at least 10 years, right? Right. That's a 10 year hold on their money. They give you a million and a half. It's a 10 year hold. There it is. It's just going to sit there. They could have earned five, 3% on the bank, but now they're getting nothing. So now you say, hey, listen, Steven, you know what? Um, as soon as you invest in my company, as soon as we close, that security is liquid. Now, I didn't say you could go out and sell it right away. I didn't say that, that, that somebody wants to buy it either. But what I'm saying to you is, if you have to, I'm not holding you back anymore. There it is. Click the button when you log in, boom, click trade, and you can start selling your shares. So it's rather interesting what's going to happen here in the next three to six months. It's the difference between... Before it was Reg D to Reg A liquidity perks. Now between the Reg A's will be, are you offering me liquidity or not? And they would, because this one here, uh, they're offering me liquidity. It, and the interesting thing people think, why do the people do it? Just want to invest in cash. They're not cashing out. It's not about cashing out. Mm. It's That's about, great. it's a feature. So there's a broker dealer that's created a secondary market. A registered for, ETFs, yes. For, for, did you say registered ETFs or? A ATS, alternative trading system. Great. So it's, it's called a secondary that? market. What firm is that? Rialto Markets. R-E-A-L-T-O Markets. Okay, we're going to make sure we get to talk to them as well. Yeah, I'll introduce you to aspect. Sherry. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, I'll introduce you to Sherry. Yeah, so Sherry Noonan is the co-founder CEO um, and 
what they're doing is fantastic. I mean, we've been hearing about trading. Look at right now, a company like Coinbase. Um, when, uh, it got out on Thursday last week that people are trading on the NASDAQ secondary market, the, the shares of Coinbase before they mm. go public. And people are going, okay, I want in. No, I'm sorry. You have to be the ultra high net worth. Mm. Got it. So uh, I don't qualify. Do, do you see what I'm saying? I so now that equalizer is here. So this has been so informative. I love this. Um, I'm a filmmaker as well. So I've done films, documentary style. And for World Tree, which was one of the stories in my uh, Igniting Impact film, uh, my documentary, I created the industry's first VR project, virtual reality, where you actually can put your Quest goggles on and go onto a plantation, one of these farms with trees, and you get to see Wendy talking, and then you get to see a farmer speaking. And I truly feel that a company that's looking to really give some great insight into the company um, before investing should consider investing in a 15, 20 minute documentary and then a three to five minute VR um, content so that people could really get that visceral experience. What do you think about that? You think if a company had yeah. that, that would put them ahead of the rest? It, it has to. I, I, you can't go into this thing. We, we've grown up too much. I mean, even the industry itself. I mean, when you look at the way things were done in the early days, I'll give an example. One example is the legal fees. I mean, I remember the very first Reg A was a million dollars. Today it's 50000 how did that happen? Well, it's like anything else. Education, we knew how to do it. The lawyers got out system. Everything is a constant movement. David Wheel says this is the biggest momentum we've ever had. The catalyst to this is COVID-19. So because of that catalyst, we need to find a different delivery mechanism to get people educated on all sides of the fence. So not only do we need to educate the issuer, the company, on what's in stake for them, but also the providers and more importantly, the investors. Because without them, all of this is moot, right? It's their money, their retirement money. They're, they're, they, they want a great entrepreneur. They want a great company, a great combination. And the more assurances they have, but there is no regulation that I know of anywhere in the world today, like a reggae that takes away 90% of the concerns investors have. Are you for real? Mm. I mean, you. you it, it, this is, are you for real? Are you for real, right? Is it, so for a company to pass the, that part of the SEC, you, you already there. So it's a great start, 2021. Well, the future is looking super bright for you, Asker, and for Core Connects to be able to bring capital to impactful entrepreneurs to scale and grow. And I'm so grateful that you've created this company and you see the future. Any closing words for our listeners as, as we you know, conclude this, but also move on to other segments, including angel investing and venture capital? Any, any words on your aspect of the world where you sit? I just think you are in for one of the most, uh, I, I rarely, I don't use the word revolutionary, but it is empowering that you finally get to be on the driver's seat but it comes with responsibility. So get educated. The education is there. It's free. Everybody's willing to help provide it to you. And there's no excuse anymore. There are, there are no excuses anymore for an unsuccessful. It's the, the only reason is, you know, you're not, you want landing on your lap and uh, that's just not the way it's going to operate. So thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And that is a co-founder of Core Connects, spelled K-O-R-E-C-O-N-X, Oscar Joffrey. It's been wonderful talking about the democratization and the digitization of capital raising in this whole new realm. Oscar, thank you so much for being part of this episode today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care, Steve. You too.